All right, all right, all right. What's happening, guys? Your Shula here, Xavier Smith, Excellent Solutions. And uh, speaking of Excellent Solutions, I've got a great solution for you today. I've got next to me, Asia Evans. She's a bobsledder for the US Olympic team. And we're gonna be talking about her, who she is, what she stands for. We're gonna just have some fun. I like to call it a conversation of excellence. So here's the deal. If you are into that, you wanna learn a little bit more about this beautiful soul next to me, then here's what I want you to do. Stay tuned. Welcome back, folks, and hello to you, Asia. What's happening, champ? How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you for being on board, and uh, we're just going to get right into it. Uh, Asia, I want you to take the opportunity to tell the world who you are, uh, what you do, and then we'll get into a little bit more uh, because I've got something that I think will impress the people that watch. So tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, yeah, so my name is Asia Evans. I'm an Olympic medalist bobsledder for Team USA. I do. I started bobsled around 2012 um, and grew up as a track and field athlete from the south side of Chicago. And so I kind of stumbled across bobsled because my senior year of college, uh, my coach told me about the sport and how they did these combine style testing events to kind of get your foot in the door and see what you bring to the table. And so we did similar testing going into our season and he's compared my numbers and thought I'd be a great fit just off that alone. And I didn't think much of it at the time because I thought I was going to do everything I wanted to accomplish in track and field. Um, yeah. But I went on to work as like a sports performance coach and helping all my clients. And I just wanted to to the action for myself. So that's how bobsled came back into the picture. Oh, sweet, sweet. And I, I, I can tell you right now, you know, you've got so many more fans because you decided to travel down that path, myself included. Um, mm -hmm. Just so you know, you got a new follower um, because when I learned that we were going to be talking together, I was like, let me go ahead and do some research. So, and I've got something that I'd like the world to know. Uh, I'm going to bring it up and uh, it's just going to give give the world a, a bitter, bigger picture of who you are and some of the, the family ties that you bring to the table too. So let's check this out. I never doubt myself. I think with me, with doing sports and, and all these things my mom exposed me to, it allowed me to go after what I wanted, no matter who told me I couldn't do it. My name is Asia Evans, and I'm a brakeman for the USA Women's Balsa team. Because I'm from a certain place, because I may look a certain way, people kind of make their own assumptions about who I am as a person. When I tell them that I do something unconventional like bobsled, they usually follow up with the phrase, so how'd you get in the bobsled? As a child, I felt like it was important for Asia to have exposure to the world outside of Chicago. When my mom started us in camps and doing all these different things, it allowed us to kind of see outside of that and, and get more exposed to the rest of the world. Black children, other minorities from urban areas, they don't know the power that they have. I was there as a parent and I was also there in her head. What I taught Asia is that she has to believe in herself and to go the extra mile when everybody else didn't want to. She has the original game face, and I think it got instilled in me <laughs> at a very early age. She's kind of always there, always understanding, and she's the only person in this world that really gets me for who I am. That is amazing right there. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, would you say, because it seems like moms brings to the table some, some encouragement, some uh, inspiration. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how it was when you were growing up with mom? 
Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, I have two other siblings, an older brother and a younger sister. And so um, my parents got divorced when I was a, pretty young. So I most of my memories are at home with my mother, making sure all of us got where we needed to be. Um, my brother went on to play um, professional sports as well. He's played in the NFL for eight years. So, you know, I just remember my mom being, having such a go-getter mentality, really um, making sure we had everything we needed, whether we needed to be picked up or, you know, some gear for our sports programs or whatever. My mom just made it happen. And so um, I really appreciated that because it was never any sense of lack or anything. It was always an encouraging environment. Now, that's beautiful right there. So a question that I'm thinking of, uh, for me, I'm, I'm a big focuser on discipline. And for a sport such as yours, how big of a role is discipline in your life for as far as training is concerned and you know, just doing what you have to do? Oh, absolutely. I think discipline is everything. Um, and the lessons I learned about discipline came from my involvement in sports. I think that... Uh, learning to be disciplined, learning to set goals and do what I needed to to obtain those goals through sports allowed it to carry over into my everyday life and continue to elevate, you know, all these different areas of my life, not just what I was doing in career or sports. And so I appreciate those lessons because I realize how difficult it is for people to uh, learn discipline in any form. And I think that um, even now when people approach me, whether it be like about workouts or getting fit and stuff like that, a lot of that comes back to having that discipline. And um, a lot of people don't want to do it. Like it's just easier <laughs> not to do something else. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. We could talk forever and ever about that because like uh, going a little bit about me is uh, my company is called Excellent Solutions. And one of my mottos is why be mediocre when you can be excellent mm -hmm. sometimes i had somebody uh, a client a long time ago we were you know she was about a month into my particular style of training and <laughs> she said you know what coach x i think right now i'd rather be mediocre <laughs> um, that's a real thing too <laughs> but um i think too like excellence and it's a choice. Like you have to make the decision to pursue it and want um, that. And it comes with and realize what it comes with. But uh, what I like to do is try and have fun with it. I, I remember um, one time I was in the training center in Lake Placid and one of my teammates in there, like I would have my headphones on, um, enjoying the music, getting in a great lift. And she she like kind of stopped me to tell me like I was doing a lot or doing too much or something like that. And I was just like, like, why would I do anything less? But it's what I, I realized is sometimes in pulling that, bringing that out of myself, I think it brings up other things for other people. So they yeah. may see that, you know, it makes them feel a certain way or whatever. And so as I started to grow both as an athlete and as a person, um, I had to realize that like other people and their perceptions weren't a reflection of me and that a lot of times, um, you know, your confidence and and your light can rub some people the wrong way. But, uh, you know, I don't have that's to. Not, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's not your responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, I think that is a huge part of why why I think we would get along because you know there is a uh, a certain je ne sais quoi that people bring to the table, and what I think who said it best was something along the lines of what Denzel had said. Uh, Sometimes your light rubs the the demons and others the wrong way, mm -hmm. uh, something to that effect. Yeah. And, uh, it really, I really bought into that because when, like you said, the excellence is a choice. So, so is happiness. Like yeah. um, I'm a big believer in not allowing circumstances to control the way I see the world and, you know, the way I show up. Yeah, so, absolutely. 
Yeah, I, I totally uh, hands. Like you get a Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> thumbs up for that one. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit more about that. You are big into training. You you got into this uh, this Olympic energy, this Olympic space. You know a lot about training. Are, are you spending more time in helping others now? What is your ultimate goal with all the stuff that you've learned so far? Well, I think um, it's not necessarily stuff. I think it's my purpose. And mm -hmm. all of it is shown in different ways and different ways it needs to be shown in order to be received, um, whether it's going, speaking firsthand with kids at Chicago Public Schools, where I'm from, yeah. whether it's you know, performing as a black woman from the South side of Chicago on the highest stage in sports, um, whether it's like, you know, speaking on your podcast and doing different things. I think all of this is centered around my purpose is who I am authentically is who I was meant to be, no matter how much I try and avoid it. <laughs> and I don't love the spotlight all the time or, um, you know, yeah. some of the things I'm called to do. But I really feel like I'm living in my purpose. And so it's always 100% worth it. Okay. I like that. Okay. So I got a quick question. This is totally off the topic, but I like to interject these little quick questions because it gives people a sense of who you are as a human. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite cheat meal? Um. So for me, I don't know. I don't look at it like that. Like, okay. I, I eat very healthy day yep. to day. So especially um, in season and stuff like that, I keep a pretty clean, healthy routine. Like I love vegetables. I don't even feel right if it's not like some color on my plate. Um, yes. But I have a major sweet tooth. So it's not necessarily a cheat meal. It's just I'm going to eat some candy, uh. some buns, some cupcakes. <laughs> I don't care. Don't bother me um when it comes to my sweets <laughs> yes yes well see there's another thing that puts us together because you put some chocolate chip cookies in front of me it's a done deal <laughs> yeah, like i work out hard enough i'll be fine <laughs> yeah that's it that is it so let's talk about your training schedule so you are you have an in season you're off season do you train all year round or do you change it up tell us a little bit more about that yeah. So again, like having a consistent routine and that discipline is always what it comes down to for me, even like recovery. Like, yes, I train very, very hard, but I also had to plan to like have recovery taken care of just as hard, just as much from working with chiropractors, massage therapists, even using like what brought us here today, my DNA vibe jazz band regularly, like regularly. It yeah. has really transformed my performance both in season and out of season like my day-to-day -day life so i think that learning to have like a consistent routine really helped carry over no matter what it was in season my routine is a lot more strenuous because i have to do both bobsled training and my um just regular strength and conditioning and speed work. So that comes a lot to two a days, wow. early mornings at the bobsled track for a few hours, then going back to the garage, moving our sleds, breaking them down, and then doing my own workout team meetings. Um, <laughs> we have to maintain a certain weight. So yep. may require me to make sure I do a little additional cardio because we travel um, most of the season we're spending time in like a European country. And so um, they provide all the food and, and everything for us. So sometimes, you know, they're very nice and accommodating, but it's not me cooking or right, like my mama and, you know, Germany right. they love snitch, schnitzel, schnitzel. And like, yep. you know, they like a lot of things that don't agree with my diet, especially in season. So I have to sometimes do things mm. to, balance that out, but make sure I'm still getting my nutrients. And then off season, um, I like to have a lot more fun with my workouts. And I mean, I don't know if my coaches are going to look at this. Like, I'm not saying y'all workouts aren't fun, but <laughs> in the off season, I enjoy like switching it up a little more, yeah. trying yeah. like yoga classes, um, getting outside, living here in Georgia has yeah. been amazing for me because I love hiking, just 
walking, being in the nature. So it's a bunch of beautiful trails and stuff out here. Um, and then enjoying it with friends. I think that makes it fun and competitive for me because my friends will invite me to some classes thinking that I'm going to dominate because I'm, I'm an Olympian and I get my butt handed to me. And they're like, <laughs> so it's, it's encouraging for me because I know yeah. I'm not an Olympian at everything, but people still think I just pick up stuff and be an Olympian at it. <laughs> All right. Right. Well, you know, that, that goes to perception. I think we talked about yeah. that earlier in the show uh, and how people perceive things, you know, it could be far from the actual truth. Mm -hmm. But uh, kudos to you for being willing. You know, uh, I know a lot of especially guys, you know, I've, I've been teaching fitness and helping people get better at the game of life since 2007. And mostly my clientele consists of about 98, maybe a little bit less now of women because they actually listen to what I and, you know, receive what I'm telling them. Whereas guys, they come to me kind of already thinking that they know it all. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm like, well. If you're having back problems, you might want to be open to other mm -hmm. things like yoga uh, and flexibility and things like oh that. Oh, my goodness. Game changes. But see, that's the part in realizing what excellence looks like. It's not yes. just um, crushing my body in the gym with hundreds of pounds of weights for squats and, you know, moving heavy sleds. It's also realizing I need the sufficient amount of sleep. I need... Yes. Um, to yes. drink a, a, a decent amount of water so my muscles are hydrated. It's like new, it's like nourishing my body. It's uh, getting soft tissue work, drinking water after that. It's like understanding how it all works together as a system, not um, one, just greater than the other. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. So let's talk a little quickly about go back to the DNA vibe because I know recovery is absolutely important. Would you agree with me, Asia? For, for the common person, you know, who maybe is getting off the couch and trying to get into a training regimen, some of them like to go hard or go home and they don't really focus on the stretching or the recovery phase. Have you found that in your experience? Oh, absolutely. Even on an elite level, I used to be with some of those football players like, what's wrong with you? And they would just come straight into the gym hit the weights. And one dude told me once, have you ever seen a cheetah warm up? I was like, okay, fair enough. Right. No, I have not. <laughs> but I personally know that there's so much power in um, warming up and stretching and, mm. and your post uh, workout care and what you do after uh, in those moments. And so I try and preach to that as well. And to people, for people to slow down, like, Again, we talked about discipline, and I think a lot of it comes down to people to you know someone not having that type of discipline. So it seems so they want to get the results like really fast instead of realizing um, the small changes they can make daily that can create those overall results, and it lasts for like a really long time too. Longevity is the hashtag I'm thinking of because <laughs> like this absolutely. And the habits that you form around these little devices. Yes. I mean, this is not a new technology. People as way back in the far Egyptian days have been using red light technology, but now uh, they found a way to put it into a form where you can actually wear it. I use mine on my ankle, on my knees. You know, I think I might have a few years on you. Um, I'm in, in, my, in my 50s, mm -hmm. but I like to do crazy things. Like for me, my I like to train for skill versus just regular fitness. So you're looking at a 250 pound guy learning how to do handstands and I'm working my way towards one hand uh, nice. being upside down. Um, it's a journey. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I started it about almost two years ago, still having fun with it, but regular traditional workouts always bored me. And when I was in the Air Force, it was like the gyms were always crowded. People talk mm -hmm. too much. So I'm like, I want to do my own thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, you, you, how do you use your your vibe? Is it? Uh, yeah. So, so um, I use my my jazz band. I use it mainly in the mornings. That's the most consistent time for me. Uh, uh -huh. I realize just as an athlete and as a person, a person in the public light, um, yep. I need to do what things for myself to set the tone. 
um, before I really start inviting all of these <laughs> external things into my day. And yep. so part of that includes like using my jazz band. I love the cordless pack. I'm not sure if you have that yet. Um, they have like a cordless battery pack that yeah. comes with it. And yeah. That allows me to just throw it on my lower back, my shoulder, um, and continue on so I can start my day. So whether it's making like some coffee, I love journaling, listening okay. to some music, getting some fresh air. I've put it on and gone for like a morning walk, uh, just kind of doing things to really ground and center myself is my favorite time to use a jazz band. But also I keep it by my bed pretty much. Yeah. So at night, um, if I get to use it a second time or if I may have forgotten to use it earlier mm -hmm. that day, it allows me to uh, make sure I get one in for that day. Okay. So the consistency is key. <laughs> I love it. I love that. <laughs> Beautiful. I, I'm, uh, that's going to be on my uh, to do list right there. I've got the one that plugs into the wall uh, because I keep mine either here in the office or at my bedside uh, back again um, yeah. um my wife is actually using it for for her feet so it's a game changer for me um absolutely so thank you for uh being on board with that now let's switch gears for a moment because i know there's something that's really important to you and i'm thinking the hashtag uh women's rights and uh tell us a little bit about you know what kind of work you're doing in that space um i mean there's a lot going on right now centered around women's rights and we go from celebrating um you know to feeling completely defeated but uh i personally um am a big advocate for title nine which was the legislation that was created mm -hmm. to provide equal opportunity for women in education and sports and like um we just celebrated the 50th year anniversary a week ago of Title IX, which is crazy to know that it's only been that way for 50 years. But because of sports and having these opportunities, my world has changed. And so um, I do as much as I can to advocate and protect Title IX, as well as help young women and, and girls use all of the opportunities available to them to discover like what they want to do and who they want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Because it seems to me like, because you are in this space as an Olympian, it, I would assume that this has opened many more doors for you as far as opportunity is concerned. Is that right? Well, yeah. And I think uh, realizing what my platform stood for mm. was the biggest door that opened um, because I, I'm an athlete. Like I came into the sport of bobsled, wanting to win an Olympic gold medal. And I'm able to say that out loud now because I've at least won a bronze, but it didn't even feel right saying it before. But that's how audacious my goal was. And I was coming into the sport with two years until the first Olympic Games and no experience whatsoever. So having a big goal like that kept me really on my toes and doing anything and everything um, to have success. But it also allowed for some wiggle room. So, you know, I celebrate my bronze and everything like that. But like, yeah. I'm very much a, um, a, a, a high shooter. Like I like to yeah. make like my goals pretty high, but um, in yep. doing sports and and being able to have those opportunities so much of my life has changed. And in sharing that, I'm, a, I'm able to inspire and help others change, you know, the things they yeah. want to. And I didn't even realize, you know, that was what I was supposed to do until participating in Bobsled. I started receiving a lot of messages and feedback, Facebook DMs from right. people I didn't even know personally that were uh, inspired by my story it helps them to aspire to go after a new position at their job. They had kids, their children excited to watch um, a black woman on television competing in the Winter Olympic Games. Nice. Um, and so that's when I realized that, like, you know, it's really not about the medal. Um, I'm going to still go for it. But <laughs> at the end of the day, being able to stand up there and represent all that I do. Um, yeah on a, such a high esteemed international stage right. is really what's it, what, what it's about. 
That's awesome. That is awesome. Thank so you. brings me to the next question. If money were and time were no object, what would you be doing right now? Um, <laughs> right now, I'll be on vacation because I need a break. <laughs> Um, yeah, instantly my mind took me to a beach somewhere. Clear um, waters. Yeah, just a little R&R, &R, never hurt. Because, yep. you know, a lot of what I do professionally um, involves a lot of energy and extroverted mm -hmm. energy. And I'm actually very it much pretty introverted. Like, I'm the complete opposite. So sometimes... For as much time as I spend doing the things I do for work, uh, I need like triple the amount of time to recover from it. Um, oh so God. me enjoying travel, but, but travel was one of the biggest things um, that was a game changer for me as a result of playing sports. Because mm -hmm. when I started performing better in track and field, then we were getting invited to attract me in a city in another state. Then I was getting invited to ch compete in another country and then like on the highest levels. And so, um, sure, the competitor in me knew what to <laughs> do in those moments. But I also got to experience all these new environments, new food, uh, yeah. everything else. You saw my eyes light up. The food really <laughs> is what did it for me. But just being able to broaden my horizon in that sense, coming from the south side, like yeah. that was that was the game changer for me. And so I have a really deep love for travel. Um, I, I aspire to share that with everyone, especially friends and family. So I guess I would take them with me on the vacation as long as they don't really? get on my nerves. <laughs> awesome. So it tells me something about you because it, it makes me feel like we are, again, another point of connection because when I'm not, <clears throat> when the curtain is is closed, and I get to be by myself, I totally embrace that. Like, yeah. I do not mind being alone. Like, mm -hmm. please, leave me alone, <laughs> right? Yes. So absolutely. with you being an introvert, I would assume that self-care is a huge priority for you. It is, and understanding that for myself because um, I can let the pressure of the outside world and other people who all love me, but you know, it kind of can affect you. So you gotta be able to at least set the tone for myself or understand what that self-care and that that love looks like. And so it's been trial and error with figuring out what works best for me and even understanding that that's a thing. Like I'm not a bad person. I'm not lazy. I'm not these negative things associated with just doing what you need to for your own mental health and well-being. So um, it's been really great for me embracing that as I've done a lot of internal work um, centered around that. Uh, but yeah, for sure. Self-care for me is enjoying some great food. I am a big time foodie. I love cooking and having, you know, a nice, clean uh, diet at home, but when I go out, I'm eating whatever I want, and there's always room for dessert. <laughs> and I love golf; that's self care for me. Um, and just doing things, sometimes just chilling. Like I think that, like I have to remind myself sometimes that it's okay to relax and just, just relax. Uh, just be right. <laughs> yeah, just be. It's okay. You don't have to have something to do right now. Yeah, that is so amazing because in this society, it's all about, especially here in America, it seems it's more about go, go, go and do and achieve and stuff. But what about just chilling, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That part right there. Because so I'm imagining, do you do you spend any time in meditation? Yes, I do a lot of um, meditation and mindfulness. Um, so with meditation, I use uh, guided apps because yeah. in my previous experience, trying to sit there, like I forgot why I was sitting there. I probably fall asleep. My mind has gone on to what I'm eating for dinner later that day. So it's like, I need something to help at least guide me gently through the process. And then um, I also have different like short-term things that I've 
like a system I built with like my therapist and stuff to help me in moments where I feel like anxious or um, I can't exactly change my surroundings. So understanding breath work and learning how to breathe, calm myself down or um, getting some fresh air, removing nice. yourself or like, um, you know, even s simply like being able to verbalize your boundaries and, and where you stand, like a lot of that stuff can be difficult for people is super difficult for me. Um, so, but in learning how to do so, I felt so much lighter and so a lot better uh, living wise. So, you yeah. know, we all kind of go through our journeys of figuring out what it looks like for each other. That is awesome because a lot of people do not spend enough time in self. And yeah. I can't remember the great philosopher who said it, but know thyself, you know, and uh, yeah. You have to spend enough time doing that so you can know how uh, you show up uh, in the world. So, well, I mean, also, like, you know, when you do the self work, it means there's no one else to blame. Like, you can't blame anybody else. It's no one else's fault. It's, it's really on you and it's on you to address it. And so <laughs> it's like you have to be willing to be that honest with yourself, which is uh -huh. sometimes more difficult than being honest with somebody else. Yeah, that you. I cannot even express, put into words how good that I felt when you said that because personal responsibility is something that seems to be a little bit lacking. Yeah. Um, but I'm a big believer in that. I, When I get a chance to tell my story, I, I talk about my 17 year incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never spent a day in jail, but my mind kept me locked up because I was bitter, I was mad, I was frustrated, I was just angry at the world because I thought my parents owed me something. Who would have thought? Yeah. But um, yeah, I had to release myself from that jail sentence by forgiving them, letting them off the hook. And it's been a game changer ever since. And I'm assuming that took some time too. Yeah. To right? That took a minute too. And that's the thing is like, but once you had that realization of what was going on, it's like, okay, now nah, I got to do something about it. Like, and so that's the hard part. You know, it doesn't change just instantly. It's like, okay, I know yeah. this is the thing now. Now I have to do the work to address yeah, it. Yeah. 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 As a matter of fact, that is the deepest part of my speech. When I'm on stage talking about that, you know, mm -hmm. most people think, I made the decision and now my life is great. No, yeah, that just meant I was willing to do the work. Absolutely. And um, and it's an everyday thing, you yeah. know? Life equals learning. And I think Kobe, the late, great Kobe Bryant said it best, you know, use your whole life as a classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, since I heard him say that, I was like, yeah, you know, he's pretty much on point. Yeah, I think uh, being an athlete taught me to be a great student at all times because I just don't know everything and I'm cool with not knowing everything. And I respect people that are as elite in the fields where I can learn from them. So it's like giving me a new appreciation and like just acceptance to be cool with not knowing everything and vulnerable and asking for help or, you know, receiving help. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you you seem so so cool and calm and collected. Uh, the the time spent with you, I feel like it was time well spent. You've actually lifted my spirits, and uh, I well, totally thank you for being on board with us here. Um, now we have a few minutes left. If I want you to spend this time telling anyone what you would want them to know about you right now, what what would that be? Um. I think the biggest thing I would want people to know is I'm pretty human, just like them. <laughs> uh, you know, I had uh, an accident I was in in December of last year. It was a training accident. I was in Germany and we were training on the push track um, because I wasn't racing that week. Long story short, I got into an accident to where I had lacerations all over my face and had to get like 30 something stitches. And so wow. in doing so, yeah, it was pretty difficult, but in doing so and spending that month back home while my teammates are like traveling and competing and still pursuing their dreams towards the games, you know, I'm trying to stay confident and everything. And 
that's when I really relied on the work I had been doing because mm. it was the most difficult experience I had been in in my entire life. And to stay confident and empowered to where I could return back within a month and um, still get named to the Olympic team as an alternate, but still named to the Olympic team. It took yeah. a lot. And so I say that to say, like, don't be scared to just start and to get the and and to get like a routine for yourself for what yep. works for you and what feels good for you because a lot of the things I did self-care wise meditation starting my day um in a mindful state being intentional with a lot of things and doing those things for myself it helped me when it was really really physically difficult to even look in the mirror to have this persona on social media and then still know how it's looking back home and so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So like for real, I think we should all give ourselves a little grace and know that we're all human. But also, yeah. you know, the work you do pays off. And I feel like in those moments, I was the most vulnerable and just down. I had felt in a very long time, but I could rely on what I had built up to that point. And it it worked out because I was able to return back to sport, literally having stitches throughout my entire face. Yeah. And um, just a month before. And so, yeah, I think it's to realize, hey, we're not untouchable. Be gentle right. to yourself, but to also, you know, start figuring out what taking care of yourself looks like and what and doing that internal work, um, because, you know, you may really need it one day. Yeah, for <laughs> Things sure. we be complaining about are nothing until something really happened. Then you're like, damn, I wish I could. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that problem back from yesterday. I'd rather have that problem than this today's problem. Right, right. It's so true. It is crucial as to what you choose to focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is um, that's brilliant, Asia. Yeah. And I so I so appreciate you taking the time to you know talk with us. Asia dropped some nuggets of wisdom on you folks. So I'm glad this got recorded because I'm going to be redistributing this so people can just tune in at their convenience. Uh, but because Asia, uh, you, you're growing, you're expanding, and I cannot wait to see what the next chapter of your life looks like. <laughs> Same here. Thank you so much for having me, Xavier. It's been a pleasure talking with you for real. No problem. We might have to do this again. So if your schedule oh, opens up, just let, let me know and uh, we can do this one more time. Uh, it's, it, I love everything that I do. If it's not fun involved, then you probably won't see me showing up. <laughs> Moo, I need that on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sweet. So Asia, uh, thank you again. Uh, we are getting ready to sign off. And while I sign off, I just want to remind you folks, the choice is always yours. But here's the question. Why be mediocre when you can be excellent? Stay right there, Asia. We're signing off. Thank you for joining us, folks. And I will see you next time. Yeah.